reliability of the Bible. This is going to be a little more theological and philosophical than some of the others, because what we're going to do is get into definitions and terms and understandings. So a lot of reliability of the Bible presentations, you get to see reasons why it's reliable. And I have some of that at the end if we have time. This is a little bit more about defining our terms. And so to do that, I am going to talk about a number of things that have happened within the history of evangelicalism that I think will help us understand this. Anybody know, what's Fuller Seminary? Somebody tell me. What is, does anybody know what Fuller Seminary is? Give me some more. Here, it's debatable what they say about inerrancy. It wasn't always the case, but you're exactly right. So that's important. That's why I'm starting here. One more comment on Fuller. Okay, so when Fuller started, and this is us learning about ourselves a little bit. It was done in reaction to the overreaction that evangelicals had against the larger culture. In the 1900s with the modernist controversy, evolution, all of that, a lot of evangelicals at that time largely called fundamentalists, as a general rule, not totally, it's a little bit of a stereotype, went into their church caves only to emerge a generation or so later saying we need institutions, we need to stop hiding from the culture, but part of that means we gotta get ourselves educated and we've got to have institutions because institutions create stability for a movement. Part of that was fuller. Part of that was Christianity today. And Billy Graham was involved with a lot of this. So it was a very good thing. At the time, sometimes it would be called the neo-evangelicals. Well, Fuller began with some of the best and the brightest and some really smart people, Charles Woodbridge, Wilbur Smith, Harold Lenzel, um, also uh, Gleason Archer. And they eventually resigned because of problems with Fuller's definitions and understandings of inerrancy. And so in 1971, after Fuller, the seminary in Pasadena started uh, in in the 40s, in 1971, they kind of altered some of their understandings of what inerrancy was. In 76, Lenzel, a prof there, put out a book called Battle for the Bible exposing this. And there was a whole controversy with this about what do we mean, that's Lenzel, when we say inerrancy? What do we mean when we say inerrancy? Well, in 1978, some people got together in Chicago at the Hyatt Regency O'Hare And they crafted something called the 1978 Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. Nearly 300 noted evangelical scholars were there. James Boyce, Norm Geisler, John Gerstner, Carl Henry, a real father of this movement, Kenneth Conser, Lenzel, John Warwick Montgomery, Roger Nicole, J.I. Packer, shout out, Roger Proust, Earl Rodmacher, Francis Schaeffer, R.C. Sproul, and John Wenham, and 200 some other people. Do I have to name them all? I don't know them all anyway. But nonetheless, this statement is helpful because it gives definition to what we should mean when we say inerrancy. Because what do we mean? Let's find out what we mean. We're going to take a start here looking at number nine. Number nine. What does article nine say here? This is from the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. And I think this is very helpful because we have to ask ourselves, what do we mean if we say the Bible is inerrant? Which I say we should, but it's not an unqualified definition. It's a qualified definition. Why? Precision matters in these matters. So let's talk about it. We affirm that inspiration, this is the process of inscripturation, Though not conferring omniscience, did Paul know all things? No. Did John? No. They both even said they didn't. Guaranteed true and trustworthy utterance, so when they're inscripturating, on all matters of which the biblical authors were moved to speak and write. So, could they make mistakes? Yes. When they are writing what became scripture as designed by God? No. Do you understand how we're mapping this out? 
This is not a claim that the authors are Im, that, that they are perfect, but it is a claim that what God used them to write is perfect in the cases of inscripturation. So the Chicago statement on biblical inerrancy helps us understand what we mean when we talk about this. And each article has an affirmation and then a denial. We mean this, we don't mean that. We deny that the finitude or fallenness of these writers by necessity or otherwise introduce distortion or falsehood into God's word. Let me do something controversial here. Hypothetically, could a biblical author have a thought in their mind the world was flat? I think they could have. Did they? I don't know. You know why I don't know? Because it's not in the Bible. Now, someone online is going to go, yes, it is. Look at this verse right here. The firmament. Didn't you know that the four corners of the earth were going to fall off, but NASA is protecting it at the edge of the sea? It's, okay. <laughs> I've talked to those guys preaching the good news of the flat earth. <laughs> what we're saying is we wouldn't know because their limitations and understandings are not part of the final prog product of the scripture. Do we, do we understand that? Because yes, he uses men. He uses, uh, the Bible speaks of them as holy men at one place for this product that is God's word. But... He guards against human error because the Holy Spirit is the ultimate author. There's a brief, uh, a limited analogy you could make with Jesus himself. Let me explain what I mean by that. He has two natures, human and divine. I'm not talking about in the sense of being error ridden or anything like that, but he's human and divine. The scripture in a sense is human and divine. God is using these authors. There's only a few times in the Bible where we hear that it's auditory. There's a few times where we hear, usually it doesn't seem necessarily to be the case. And the process may have been more complicated than we picture. For years, I maybe pictured Paul sitting down. Dear Timothy, I write to you these things because I'm all done, finished. Take this to Timothy. Maybe, what if he's at a house? Dear Timothy... It's the Romans' roof! <laughs> Two days later, like I was saying, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Why not? We don't know exactly the context of the situation, but we know that God used this process to give us his word. So we're defining what we mean as we look at this. Next one, Article 11. And Article 13, we affirm that scripture, having been given by divine inspiration, is infallible so that far from misleading us, it is true and reliable in all the matters it addresses. Does the Bible speak on every topic? Does the Bible teach you how to fix your lawnmower? If it did, it would be inerrant, but it doesn't, right? Right? Is it wrong to read instructions to how to fix your lawnmower? No, you should do it. You know, not me, but you other guys. Okay, so this is helpful to understand that in everything the scripture teaches on, it must be reliable. And, and I hope you can see why this is important. First of all, I would say scripture says this. So this is a summary of scripture teaching on these matters. But, you know, you can just open up scripture and you can say, okay, does the Bible say something like that? I mean, there's kind of a, a big one to go to that I want to show uh, briefly. And, then, you know, there's a number of places where these are, but let me just show you one real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 3, of course, verse 16. All scripture is theanustos, 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 theo. You hear that? God breathe. All scripture is God breathe. And then it says this, <clears throat> and profitable for teaching reproof for correction, for training in righteousness and apologetic conferences. <laughs> so that the man of God may be equipped, having been thoroughly equipped for every good work. And that's just one place. And there's other places like that. Jesus says the scripture cannot be broken, for example. And so we're saying in matters it addresses, but hopefully you see why this is necessary. The scripture is an errant whenever it addresses matters of doctrine, but not of history. 
Well, they're intertwined. Was Adam a real person? If he's not, what is Paul talking about with the first Adam and the last Adam? I don't know, because it doesn't make sense if he's not a real person. Jonah wasn't really swallowed by a great fish. Well, if he wasn't, then why does Jesus point to that as a sign of his resurrection? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Sodom and Gomorrah weren't really the shore of the fire and brimstone. Well, if they weren't, then what is Jesus talking about when he says the men of Sodom will rise up and condemn you in that day? Do you guys get in the picture here? The pick and choose buffet method of biblical interpretation is problematic because then what are the guardrails? And usually when someone starts with one, but in science it's wrong, they end up with more and also sexuality. Do you see what I'm saying? This is what always happens time and time again. We deny, the statement says, that it is possible for the Bible to be at the same time infallible and errant in its assertions. Infallibility and inerrancy may be distinguished but not separated. So sometimes these words are used uh, synonymously, inerrancy and infallibility. One has to do with the idea that it's not an error. The other one has to do with the idea that it cannot ever be an error. But they're related ideas, as you can tell, because sometimes people will say, well, it's infallible but not inerrant, or they'll say something like that. They're saying no dice. Article 13, we deny that it is proper to evaluate scripture according to standards of truth and error that are alien to its usage or purpose. We further deny that inerrancy is negated by biblical phenomena, such as a lack of modern technical precision, irregularities of grammar or spelling, observational descriptions of nature, the reporting of falsehoods, the use of hyperbole and round numbers, the topical arrangement of material, variant selections of material and parallel accounts, or the use of free citations. Now, here's the thing. If you're like, what are these nerds doing in Chicago in 78? Well, here's the thing. If you don't have something like this here, here, then what do you mean when you say an inerrancy? And here's why I say that. Here's what I mean. Follow along. Because every one of these examples they give as essentially what we don't mean by inerrancy, they're in the scripture. These things happen. What do I mean? I'll explain. Look at this one right here. Observational descriptions of nature. What does that mean? Any guesses? He got it. He said, sunrise is sunsets. Does the sun rise? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Depends what you mean. We still say the sun rises, don't we? It's called phenomenological language. What it looks like. It's all right. Technically, it's not what's happening, but it's an accurate description of what it looks like, what's happening. The scripture uses that, and it's okay. There's something in the scripture called the movable new. New is a Greek character, and you'll see it ends up being in different places sometimes in spelling of the same names in the Greek New Testament. It's not always standardized how to spell it. Sometimes there's two news. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes the text will say the Jesus. It has a definite article before Jesus. Usually it's not translated. Do you ever remember reading in your Bible and the Jesus said? It'd be awkward in English. It doesn't even get translated, the definite article. It essentially is irrelevant. But sometimes it, it doesn't always say the Jesus. Sometimes there's no definite article in the Greek. That's okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Those are not what, we're not saying that can't happen when we affirm inerrancy. If we were, then we'd be in trouble because those things happen in the Greek text. Lack of modern technical precision. You know, they'll sometimes say about, rounding off of years, 400, 430, things like that. Hyperbole and round numbers. All the town came out to see him. Do you think that's what Mark was saying? He's saying lots of people came out to see Jesus, right? Variant selections of material and parallel accounts. Did the centurion come to see Jesus to ask for the servant's healing or one of the centurion's homeboys? Because the gospels have both. Ooh, what do you do? Most likely, most likely, the centurion sent somebody and the account account is sort of telescoped 
down into one, or both happened. There's different ways to deal with that, but it's reported as far as the actual account different in different gospels. So it's saying variant selections of material and parallel accounts. Like for example, Jesus will say something in one that's longer than the other. All this is in the Bible, all these things. So when we say inerrancy, we're not talking about those things because they are there. One way to see this, for example, is if you get one of those parallel Bibles. Now you can do it in programs, but it'll uh, have this, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John next to each other, you know, and you can look and you can see, oh, look, there, 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 right? That's okay because historians select by definition, by nature, God wanted four gospel accounts. Some people in the early church tried to smash all the gospel accounts into one called the Dia Tesseron, and they fought against that. They said, no, these are four different portraits of the same Jesus. This is what we want. Aren't you glad? You see the different emphasis. It's perfect. It's the same person painted from four different angles, so to speak. That's good, though. I'm glad it's like that. God superintended that. But that means they're not the same by definition. Did Jesus pray to the Father like he did in John 17? Yeah, but it's only in John 17. So, of course, the critics say, that didn't happen. Who was there to hear that prayer? Questions like that. John, John could have very easily heard it, by the way. It's not a problem. But I can't go through the whole list, but I wanted to give you a flavor. And now I want to give you reasons. Now, these reasons are somewhat different than what you're used to hearing. These are sort of logically coherent reasons that make sense within a certain system of belief because a lot of what we hold to ultimately, and this goes for everyone else, has to do with our baseline axioms, our presuppositions. There's no getting away from it. I'll give you an example of what I mean before I share this list so you're not scared. Jesus is there. I think it's in John 12. Voice from heaven, glorify your name, Father. I've glorified it. I'm going to glorify it again. Some there thought it was like thunder, or lightning, or some kind of natural phenomenon. I forget exactly what it says. They thought it was like thunder in the sky. Their presuppositions led them to say, that's not a voice speaking. That's just noise from the heavens. He, we, 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 know, we know he does miracles, but it's because he has power from the devil. They're not denying the miracles. They're interpreting the actions, though, through a previously existing worldview that says this man can't do that because he's a false teacher. Therefore, it's from the devil. They saw the same thing that the believers saw, didn't they? But they didn't just believe, did they? Do you realize all your friends and even you before you came to the Lord who say, but if I saw this in front of my eyes, I would believe? No, you wouldn't unless the Lord moved upon your heart. That's the message of scripture because the Pharisees saw it all. Have you ever wondered what were they thinking paying off the Roman soldiers? They knew that Jesus rose from the dead and they didn't change. Isn't that wild? I even saw Richard Dawkins once. He's, he's a, I, I used to say that I can't really do it. David can do it. If I looked up in the sky and saw my name spelled out in the stars, I would say there's a God who exists. And then he says, but now I've come to realize that's not true. I would just say aliens did it or something like that. <laughs> At least he's being more honest, I suppose. But your presuppositions matter. Three reasons the Bible is inerrant. One is the authority of Jesus. Why do I ultimately believe in errancy? Because I believe what Jesus said. But how do you know what Jesus said? It's in the Bible. Uh-oh, but that's the fact of the matter, isn't it? Try to escape the circle, I dare you. This is partially designed to challenge you and get you to think. Because I would say all worldviews are circular at bottom's end in relationship to their ultimate authorities. And there's no way to escape from it because the second you go to a different ultimate authority, that's your ultimate authority. You can't escape it. For example, why do you believe that? Because I saw it in my own eyes. How do you know your eyes are trustworthy? And you go down this rabbit hole that ends up with self being the ultimate authority. No way to escape from it. Philosophers have talked about this, specifically Immanuel Kant. You guys talking about Kant over there? Care to share with the class? <laughs> What'd you say? Oh, um, yeah, we, we like to discuss uh, the relationship between presuppositions. Hmm. Well, I can't get into that right now. 
Secondly, the character of God. If God knows all, how's he going to inscripturate something that's false? How could he make a mistake? So when we point out errors in scripture, there's an assumption there saying, well, it's either not from God, there isn't a God. But if God knows all, is only truthful, how could what he inscripturates be anything other than perfect and truthful? It can't. Now, this includes records, historical records. Here's what I mean by that. Does the Bible contain lies in it? Trick question. Yeah. You won't surely die. It's an accurate recording of a lie. Did God say that? No, but did Satan say he said that? Yeah, so it's an accurate recording of a lie. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm trying to play with your mind a little bit here today. Thirdly, the impossibility to the con of the contrary. Any other ultimate authority will ultimately crumble. There are some good debates on this. I'm going to recommend one that you might have heard. It's Greg Bonson versus Gordon Stein. It's an older debate, but like, but like uh, the Imperial officer told Vader in Return of the Jedi, it's an older code, but it checks out. It still works is what I'm saying. The impossibility of the contrary. That means nothing else can be true. And this is a scriptural concept. Can I show it to you? He who builds his house upon the rock, wise, versus he who builds house upon the sand, foolish. The foundation upon which you are standing. Wisdom cries aloud in the streets. Do you see the Bible is filled with this kind of call to wisdom and points it ultimately to God himself. The Bible's not anti-intellectual. It's not anti-educational. It's not anti-wisdom. We have wisdom books for goodness sakes. The Quran ain't got no wisdom books in there. I'm sure a couple of times where Muhammad tried to imitate it, but my goodness, we've got the wisdom books. Don't hate knowledge and learning and wisdom. Jesus said, wisdom will be justified by her children in the end. And if you do a deep dive into the Old Testament, you'll see how in a way Jesus is sort of the living, breathing embodiment of God's wisdom in the old. Now, I don't mean that literally. I'm not saying he was created or he's feminine like women's described. I'm saying that Jesus has shown up as the ultimate sign of God's wisdom. And indeed, Colossians talks about all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden in Christ. Are we seeing this? I hope that we're seeing this. Now, I'm going to break down the reasons a little bit more here to hopefully help you a little bit. I mentioned this one before, but I think it's a very important verse. Simply, John 10, 35, Scripture cannot be broken. I think the emphasis here has to do with the consistency. Uh, the Greek word there is loosed. The Greek word there where it says broken, it's a Greek word that can also mean loosed. And you see a parallel in a couple places. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Let me make sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm just looking. Uh, but boom, boom, Okay. Yeah, yeah, that is what that means. But now on to the next one. I want to make sure I'm not mixing up my notes. I got notes here. I got to make sure they're talking about which one is which. Now, Matthew 5, 18, actually, that's where the loose is. But here's, here's, here's what Matthew 5, 18 is. The thing I said about the Greek applies to Matthew 5, 18, not Gen, John 10, 35. Sorry about that. But it is the fact that scripture cannot be broken. Jesus is speaking to the inconsistency and the interconnectedness of the Testaments, ultimately. I do believe, indeed. And he's saying he's in line with that. Now, moving on to Matthew 5, 18. The thing about loosed is from there, and there is a very important phrase, not an iota, not a dot. Sometimes you'll see people say the smallest letter, which seems to uh, refer to the, the Hebrew letter yod, which is like a tiny little apostrophe, this, this stroke uh, Jesus talks about, which is like this minute distinction between two Hebrew letters, and it's kind of like the difference between an O and a Q, right? Is he saying even that small little difference wouldn't be taken away, right? And so he's emphasizing here, Jesus, that details of the Old Testament writings must be fulfilled to the very letter. What Jesus is saying is that he did fulfill them in the very letter. Now in Greek, iota is the smallest Greek vowel. Matthew essentially here uses it to represent the Hebrew yod, which is the smallest Hebrew letter. And so when you see that, you understand he's saying down to the little bitty itty, maybe in English, the dot of the I, the cross of the T is kind of a rough equivalent. And the point, what he's saying there has to do with how scripture is continuous, accurate, perfect, true, and unchanging. Secondly, related to the character of God, Second Peter, I mentioned this briefly before, 
This is a great passage. And just know if you ever get into debates with someone who's maybe taken one New Testament class at school, if you bring up 2 Peter, they will tell you that Peter did not write it. It was a forgery because Bart Ehrman told them so. And that's important to understand. Now, 2 Peter is probably the most contested about authorship book in the New Testament uh, because of some of the differences between 1 and 2 Peter. But all that can be explained if Peter used an amanuensis, which is like an ancient secretary. And oh, Peter says he used a secretary. So I guess that explains the differences. First of all, let me read uh, 1 Peter 1, 19 through 21. Say what? Did you tell that to Bart? Oh, did I tell him? I never talked to Bart, but to, uh, yesterday from one of our people who was in contact with Bart, I heard that if you debate him, he wants to do it behind a paywall and he'll take 90% of the gate. So not a lot of debates with Bart coming up anytime soon. And we have as more sure the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes by one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by the will of man, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, saying, in essence, they're not the ultimate source, but God instrumentally did use them indeed. I hope we follow that. Titus 1, 1 through 3 speaks about a God who never lies. Therefore, if he never lies, how can scripture have lies? I apologize. People were taking pictures before I've got to the second bullet point. You're like, I got to take another picture. Sorry, you got a delete button. Just make sure you clear out your trash. It will get clogged up and you won't have room on your phone for pictures of kids in Florida. The impossibility of the contrary. Let's talk about that. I mentioned Matthew 7, 24 through 29. The contrast between the foolish man who built his house upon the sand and the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. And part of what I believe we should do as apologists, evangelists, is to say in a loving way, my feet are upon the rock. Let me tell you why it makes sense. I see your feet are upon sand. Can I point out the flaws and errors in your system now? It's called an internal critique. You critique a system according to its own internal logic. This is where David came up with the Quran dilemma, where you have it affirming yet denying scripture, for example. Do you see that? It's based upon an internal critique of things that it claims. With a lot of naturalistic explanations of science and a godless universe, what will they say? They will say, well, if it's not something that we currently see operating in the world, then it can't be an explanation for anything, right? So how did everything come from nothing? Because I haven't seen that happen lately. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, it's almost like it was a miracle, they might say. They, they sometimes say this. Yeah, it's kind of like it was a miracle. Funny thing. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 through 20. Since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Remember this? Hebrews talking about Yahweh, and he says, I basically take it as he's saying, God said, I swear to myself. God says, I swear to God. You see what I'm saying? Because when people do this in courtroom, I'm sure one day it'll change, right? Place their hand upon, you know, my book. What do they say? They say, I swear to, the ideas are swearing upon authority greater than themselves. Who is God's greater authority? There is none. You see how the scripture is the ultimate authority? And indeed, there's something called the self-attestation of scripture, where scripture has a self, not just attesting, but also self-authenticating nature to it because it's an ultimate authority. Some of this is new to some of you. Apparently not to the peanut gallery over here, though. <laughs> That's all right. I love you guys. Now, here's some questions on a practical level. Level, There's a number of them, so maybe wait till I get through all of them for you picture takers, just, just to try to help you out. The, I think it help you devotionally when you read God's word, because what I want to do is also practically help you as you read God's word to read it as if it is inerrant. So first question to ask yourself is, do I study scripture as if I know it is inerrant? Now, if we're honest, basically the answer is none of us do. Because if we did, I think we'd be more obedient. I think we'd be wrestling with a lot more. But this is our sin. We don't want to stay there. Lord, help us. Read scripture prayerfully and understand God's about to speak. When you hear preaching and teaching from God's word, you listen as if you know that God's word is inerrant. 
Some people watching, I don't know about anybody here, go to churches where God's word is hardly ever opened or spoken of, so this question is almost moot. That means you're in the wrong church, of course. But when you hear good gospel preaching and it's faithful exposition, you should listen to it as if it's an errant and then obey scripture as if it's an errant. We know this isn't easy. Who wants to go to an apologetics conference and get convicted of sin? Not I. Sorry. Do our ethics reflect that we know scripture is inerrant? Because these doctrines cannot be merely theoretical. It can't just be merely out here. They've got to be practical. Every single one of us, we pray, Lord, help us. What we do matches what we say. Do we share the gospel with others in a way that is congruent with the fact that the Bible is inerrant? Apologists have different opinions about this, but when someone tells me, but I don't believe in the Bible, so you can't use it, I don't argue with them about it, but am I going to stop using the Bible because an unbeliever told me not to? What? No. Why would you do that? It's like, you know, here in battle, and you've got this M60 machine gun, like, you know, Rambo, and the other guy's got a hunting knife. He's like, don't use that M60 machine gun. I'm like, okay, whatever you say. I've got a toothpick here, though. Is that cool? Sure. I'm not going to put away the machine gun. Why are you going to put away the machine gun for? Hebrews 4.12. Double-edged. Penetrates. Like I said, I don't need to argue with about it. I'm just not going to obey them. But they don't think it's God's word. Well, isn't that the problem while we're talking to them? Isn't that like kind of the whole problem? Jesus talking to people who didn't think he was a Messiah. He didn't say, well, I won't claim that for this conversation. Put that aside. Bracket that. Let's table that until the next meeting. No. He said, I'm the Messiah, bro. You search the scriptures thinking you're going to find life. You don't know, but they speak about me. John 5, 39. Do we disciple others in a way that shows we know the Bible is inerrant? If you're discipling someone and you get together to share them with your nuggets and wisdom, that's nice, I guess. But make the Bible the focal point of the discipleship, not your wisdom of nuggets. Throw those in there if you got them. But you know, it's not just because you're so great, right? That's not what discipleship is about, is it? Clones of you? No. Now, there's more to say here. I was going to try to maybe go through Psalm 119. We don't have time to go through Psalm 119.